Hi, welcome back, and thanks for sticking with us. Uh, this presentation, part three, covers what DO254 compliance really entails, and it should answer a lot of your high-level questions. Um, this part of the presentation is a little bit longer than the, the last two, so hang in there with me. In part two, in going over the structure of the document, I briefly introduced figure 5.1 to demonstrate how it visually assists with the layout of the document. In this presentation, we're going to take a dive down inside each box in this graphic. Now, just to recap, to understand what you're looking at here, figure 5.1 defines the scope, flow, interactions, steps or phases, and iterations of a DO254 compliance project. It also maps each of these facets to where you can find more information in the document itself. So in my opinion, at least, figure 5.1 is the most important singular thing in the DO254 document. Bookmark it. Flip the page back, do whatever you need to do to remind yourself to come back to this graphic if you're feeling a little lost or don't understand how the task that you're, you know, that you're performing fits into the whole. This, this is a great summary. Now let's start looking at this graphic piece by piece, starting with DO254's link to system processes. The system processes are shown on the far left, outside of the dashed line that represents the barrier to the DO254 process, or the boundary. Um, but there are arrows going to and from what's called the hardware design processes. So those interactions are the most important thing to understand. The system processes feed down into the hardware development or DO254 domain. The standards that are used in the system context, basically the DO254 equivalent for systems, are the combination of two documents, ARP 4754B and ARP 4761A. I'll talk more specifically about those documents in part four, but for now, you need to understand that what the system processes hand down to DO254 are two things the requirements assigned to the hardware, and the design assurance level, or the development assurance level, the DAO, which applies to the hardware item's safety impact. So the hardware plays a role or has a function in the system that it serves, of course. This function is defined by a set of requirements. These requirements are handed down from the system to the DO254 process where they're validated and designed into hardware. The hardware item also has an assigned DAO, called an item DAO, which is based on the system function and the safety analysis that's performed at that higher level. The higher the DAO, the more work DO254 will entail. Now, those are the arrows that point in from the system processes to DO254, but if you look closely at figure 5.1, you'll also see an arrow that points from hardware to system. This is because anytime the hardware requirements change, and they will likely change during the design process to some extent, these changes have to be reviewed back at the system level to ensure that they are understood, that they're accepted, and that they don't have an adverse safety impact. Okay, now let's step inside the boundary of the actual DO254 process. The first step is planning, and planning drives everything. Now, a lot of engineers aren't really excited by the word planning. They'd rather just dive in and start designing, and I get it, but in a DO254 project, planning is very important. And if you think you can retroactively come up with your plans to describe what you've already done, that really runs counter to the intent of DO254. Planning, as I just said, is the first step in the DO254 process. During planning, the team develops a set of documents that precisely captures how your team will meet all the DO254 objectives including the activities you'll perform, who will perform them, what data or evidence you'll have to demonstrate this, and where that data resides. The planning documents are extensive and detailed. Uh, the main one is called the Plan for Hardware Aspects of Certification, or PHAC for short. You'll hear that word PHAC all the time. The PHAC provides an overview of the entire compliance process and references all the appropriate secondary documents involved in the project. And don't think you can skip the step because the certification authorities will audit you to review your plans before you get started. 
These audits are called stage of involvement audits, or that's S-O-I, soy, they say, so soy audits. The first one is soy one, and it is typically held at the end of the planning process to review all of your plans. Looking back at figure 5.1, we can see that planning drives two main aspects of DO254 compliance, the supporting processes and the hardware design processes. Let's start by looking at the various phases of the hardware design processes. The first one is requirements capture. Requirements capture is the first step in the hardware design process. And where do those requirements come from? As I explained a few minutes ago, they're handed down from the system processes. Here in the context of the DO254 project, the team will capture these requirements, break them down, probably expand upon them, um, basically refine them so they can be used in the hardware context. Writing good requirements is key to DO254 success. And writing good requirements is both an art and a science, but ultimately these requirements need to be clear concise, unambiguous, unique, complete, and testable. In a few minutes, I'll talk about the supporting processes, but for the moment, I'll simply mention that the supporting process is called validation, ensures that the requirements are captured well and meet all this criteria. Now, while requirements capture is the first step in the process, it's important to note that there are some iterations to this process. Oftentimes during the design, process, the team realizes that some requirements are missing or need to be tweaked. And when this happens, those new or modified requirements need to go through this process again. And remember, new or modified requirements also need to be fed back to the system level for review to ensure that they aren't changing any functions or have any adverse safety impacts at the system level. After requirements, capture in the hardware design process is conceptual design. Conceptual design examines the validated requirements and forms them into a design concept. This usually takes the form of a block diagram and descriptive text, or it might be some sort of like high level model that you're developing. In any case, the design concept focuses on the basics of how the requirements, including the safety requirements, will be met. After the design concept is developed and it's evaluated and verified, the next step is creating the detailed design. In the detailed design phase, each requirement is developed in detail. This typically entails writing HDL code and then synthesizing this into a technology specific netlist. At least those are the steps for your typical FPGA design. Of course, it would be very different if you're developing a whole board or a multi-board LRU. Regardless of the type of hardware item though, once the detailed design has been baselined, which really means that requirements are stable and developed into some kind of workable version of a detailed design, you, you snapshot it um, and then you keep it under version control. That's, that's your baseline. Once that has happened, you typically have your second formal audit called SOI2. After the design is developed, it goes into the implementation phase. Now this might seem a little bit confusing. What is implementation? Isn't it the same as design? Like if you're designing something, aren't you implementing it? Well, yes and no. For FPGAs, which are by far the most common type of devices used in aerospace designs, um, during implementation, the netlist is taken through back-end placement and routing processes turned into the device specific bitstream and then loaded into the FPGA device. So basically in implementation, you're moving from a higher level design to a lower level technology specific implementation of the design. After implementation, the final phase of hardware design is production transition. Now, keep in mind, the actual manufacturing process for the hardware is outside the scope of DO254. Not that these processes aren't controlled, but they aren't covered by DO254 itself. Here in Figure 5.1, you can see that designated by the arrow pointing to the dashed line indicating the boundary of DO254. 
with manufacturing being on the far right um, outside of that dashed line. So production transition is the final step in the hardware design process of DO254. But what's it mean if it doesn't include manufacturing? Well, here the team captures and tests the processes to ensure that they can get from the controlled design code to the exact same programmed or manufactured hardware device every single time. So after all, you want to ensure that this thing that you've developed to be DO254 compliant is actually the same thing that will be installed on the aircraft. And note that the SOI audit, SOI 4, is typically held when this can be demonstrated. Now, what happened to SOI 3, you might ask? Stay tuned. I'll come back to that shortly. So we've just gone through each phase of that lower portion of the graphic called the hardware design processes. Now, earlier I said planning drives everything. Planning certainly drives those hardware design processes, but planning also drives what is called the supporting processes. While the hardware design processes have distinct phases, and even though there might be iterations, you generally progress through them linearly, that isn't really true with the supporting processes, which you can see in the upper right-hand box that's highlighted. All the supporting processes occur throughout the hardware design process. The first one of these supporting processes that I'm going to explain is called validation and verification. Validation and verification, sometimes called V&B, &B, are often blended together into one category, even though they are somewhat distinct. I'll try to explain what they are and how they're different, um, but very synergistic here. Validation means ensuring that the hardware device that you're developing has the right set of requirements. It asks the question, are we building the right thing? Now it's partner verification means ensuring that the device as it's being designed meets the requirements. It asks the question, are we building this thing right? Now VNV &V go hand in hand through a variety of activities that occur during development. That third soy audit that I said I'd get back to, it covers verification. It's typically held to review both simulation of the results uh, or simulation results as well as testing of the actual implemented hardware device, which is called target testing. And sometimes that SOI 3 audit can be broken down into two parts since these two activities might occur at different times in the design process. The next supporting process is configuration management. Configuration management means controlling each designated document, data item, design object, and tool that has significance in the project. And by controlling, we mean assigning unique identifiers, controlling versions, controlling access, and ensuring proper archival. The next supporting process is process assurance. Process assurance is the ongoing task of monitoring the actual work being done against the plans. Think of it like quality assurance or QA, but instead of focusing on the quality of the product, which is what the V&B activities do, it focuses on the quality of the process. It asks and then answers the question, did the team do what they said they were going to do, what we documented in the plans? In the DO254 process, there is a person with the actual role of process assurance. And they are the process assurance manager, the process assurance engineer. Um, one thing that they do typically is run mock audits to find and fix any deviation from the plans prior to formal audits held by the certification authorities. The final supporting process is certification liaison. I've actually already talked about certification liaison uh, without using those exact words. Certification liaison is the process of the team interacting with the certification authorities. Now these authorities might be directly from the FAA or more likely probably their designated engineering representatives or DERs. The FAA has very little staff so it's usually through their designees um, with oversight done through FAA that this certification liaison occurs. So when you have those formal SOI audits that's certification liaison. It also happens when you send data for review, 
answer questions the auditors might have, um, review the post audit reports, all of that. Any of those interactions with the certification authorities or their designees is considered certification liaison. And these authorities are the ones who will ultimately grant you DO 254 compliance approval. Okay, now, if you remember one thing from this presentation, it's to bookmark figure 5-1. This figure truly encapsulates the whole DO 254 process, that process that we just talked through at a very high level, of course. So what's next in your learning? Please tune in to part four of this series, which covers all the other documents besides DO 254 that you have to be aware of and understand. Also, I mentioned the critical supporting process called certification liaison. If you haven't already, you should seek out one of those designees from the FAA called a DER. The directory of them can be kind of hard to find online, but there is a copy on the airworthinesscert.com site um, at the link that I'm showing here. Um, if you go to the website, basically look under the free stuff and then under the heading of policy docs, and you'll find it right there at the top. Now, there's a lot of folks who claim to be DO254 experts out there, but your best bet is to really find one that the FAA trusts and considers an expert, someone who they've designated their authority to. Those are truly DERs, and that's what this directory provides.